Listeners, what presidents have we had over the last, say, 50 years or so since Nixon? There was, let's see, Obama. People seem to be remembering his years as a decidedly mixed term. Well, with all the deportations and drone wars and other general policy disasters and all. But at least he was so much classier than Trump and smarter than George W. Bush. We know the problems with Clinton and with H.W. Bush, who started this whole forever war thing in the first place. Then jumping back a bit, people like Carter, after he was president, well, we kind of like him then, but as president, we remember him as a sort of feckless and useless leader, kind of like Ford, as a matter of fact. Only Ronald Reagan really retains this demigod-like status reserved for former presidents. And that administration's cloud of mythology really needs to be dispelled. So, we take you now to a recording from one of our other programs, an in-house lecture series we call Speak for a Sandwich, and historian Marcus Witcher discussing his new book, Getting Right with Reagan. Yeah, thanks so much for the opportunity. I'm really, really excited to be here. Um, as I was telling Josh earlier, um, a lot of the funding for the research for this book came from IHS. Um, I received a fellowship from IHS for, I think, four years while I was in graduate school. And um, I have also received like Liberty funding, Liberty Fund funding in order to go and do archival research for both this and my future prog projects, which I'm currently working on and writing. Um, so IHS has played a tremendous role in sort of my intellectual development. It's played a tremendous role in enabling me uh, to have the resources to actually go to the archives, right? Simi Valley's a long ways away from the University of Alabama. Uh, so to have the resources to go to the archives and actually dig up uh, the research, et cetera. So I want to give you guys a huge, like, thank you, because what you all do really does make a difference in people's lives like me. Um, so thank you so much, um, whether you work in programming or whether you work in sort of like resources for academics, it really, really does make a difference. Um, today I'm here to talk about uh, my forthcoming book, Getting Right with Reagan, uh, The Struggle for True Conservatism. Um, the title of the book was actually put forward by a member of my committee. Um, he was like, there's this book back in the day called Getting Right with Lincoln that talked about sort of uh, Lincoln and who he was. He goes, your book is about, right, the Reagan, who the true Reagan was. Um, so why not call it Getting Right with Reagan? And that's largely what the book attempts to do, is it attempts to understand how conservatives viewed Reagan during the 1980s. Surprisingly, they were actually quite upset and frustrated with the Reagan administration for not getting more done. By the end of um, Reagan's two terms, people like Richard Vigory, a uh, new right activist, are talking about the failure of the Reagan revolution. Um, there's a real sort of discontent within the conservative ranks when George H.W. Bush becomes president. The belief is, is that they had this golden opportunity and they really failed. They really had failed to enact any meaningful change. Now, that was a really pessimistic view. There were some conservatives who obviously like, well, no, we fundamentally changed the tax code. We continued, although they probably didn't give President Carter any credit, we continued the trend of deregulation, right, um, et cetera. So not everybody was down in the dumps. Um, but I was really surprised as I went back through the archival record to find so many conservatives writing in places like Conservative Digest, writing even in places like National Review, Public Interest, elsewhere. Uh, conservatives from all spectrums, the new right, the social conservatives, neoconservatives, and your more traditional Buckley types. All of them were upset at one point or another with the Reagan administration. And so what I'm going to tackle today for you guys is um, the topic is Reagan, conservatives, and the end of the Cold War. Maybe the largest myth that's emerged over the course of the last 25 to 30 years, really since uh, 1995, 1996 or so, is this idea that Ronald Reagan won the Cold War by standing, sort of holding fast right to his conservative principles, not uh, moderating, um, and because he sort of took this very hard line with the Soviet Union, that's why the Cold War ultimately came to an end. And that has become sort of a conservative orthodoxy, is that um, Reagan was successful because he never deviated from his conservative principles, and if we want to be successful in the future, we need to go back to our principles. Now, I have nothing against uh, being principled, nothing against those things, but the reality is, is that many, many conservatives during the 1980s were actually quite frustrated, angry, at President Reagan's foreign policy, specifically in regards to the Soviet Union. And so that's what I'm going to show you today, is how conservatives felt during the 80s, and then we'll talk about what actually, sort of what they said around the time of the INF Treaty, we'll talk about what led to the end of the 
uh, the Cold War, and we'll talk about how Reagan wanted to remember his own sort of foreign policy legacy in regards to the Cold War. And we'll compare that and juxtapose it with what conservatives today think. You all may have seen sort of t-shirts, right? Uh, what would Reagan do t-shirts, WWRD, right? Ann Coulter, I think in 2005 or so, they had the WWRD bracelets, right? A substitute for, you know, Christians have what would Jesus do? Well, she said, well, for Republicans, it's what would Reagan do, right? And all the candidates have to ask themselves in 2008 is WWRD, right? What would Reagan do? Um, so this mythology is sort of deeply ingrained or was deeply ingrained within uh, the conservative movement and within the Republican ethos. Um, and I wonder sort of what they would think uh, if they were to sort of grapple with the ideas in the book. So I really love this quote. I wish that I had come up with it, but uh, Matt Purple in The Churchill We Must Remember says, quote, historical memory is like a great compactor, crushing nuances and flattening wrinkles until a person or event is made a perfect morsel for popular consumption, right? WWRD, what would Reagan do? By 2005, Reagan had become sort of simplified, flattened, if you will, principled. Um, and all the nuances and all the sort of variances of his administration, some of them great achievements, have been largely, largely forgotten. So what does the manuscript do? Well, we don't have to go into this at great length. Um, the manuscript tries to detail, as I've already said, a very tense relationship that existed between President Reagan and conservatives. Um, and it also tries to do what I think other, cons other historians have not done a great job at doing, which is describing the plethora of different ideas that exist on the American right. Oftentimes, conservatives are lumped into sort of one big group. Um, that's definitely not the case, right? We in this room know that there are a large uh, variety of types of conservatism. Um, it also questions whether or not the, Reagan's years were, the Reagan years were actually a triumph for conservatism. Was that sort of the pinnacle of conservatism? Um, one of my upcoming, my next book on Clinton actually argues that the 90s were actually the pinnacle of conservatism and that more conservative legislation and achievements were probably achieved during the Clinton administration, partially because of the work of Gingrich uh, and the Congress, than were actually accomplished during the 1980s. Um, and the third thing is that it examines the interconnectedness of politics, memory, and myth building uh, among conser American conservatisms this evolution of Reagan's legacy, et cetera. So that's what the manuscript does. Um, we don't have to focus on this a whole lot. We can come back to this in Q&A if anybody has any questions about evidentiary base. Um, these are some of the archives that I visited, right? Mainly the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library, uh, the Hoover Institution archives, um, et cetera, the fee archives. Okay, so what do other historians say about the end of the Cold War? There are really like four schools of thought, okay? Um, the most popular among historians is that Gorbachev deserves pretty much all the credit, most of the credit, for the end of the Cold War. His policies of glasnost and perestroika undermined the Communist Party, and by undermining the Communist Party, it tore apart basically the one thing that was holding this together, right? The threat of force, right, and coercion by... Uh, by the Communist Party. So that's the predominant school in sort of the historiography. Um, there's another school of largely leftist uh, historians who argue that Reagan actually prolonged the Cold War. Because of his militant rhetoric, the Soviets were ready to basically bring about an easing of tensions, but Reagan prolonged it because he made uh, sort of aggressive actions against the Soviets. If only he had been, you know, maybe more like Jimmy Carter or something, right, the Cold War would have ended uh, sooner. Um, Reagan definitely did say some things that extended the Cold War, but I'm going to make an argument that that's not tenable. Uh, there's the Reagan Victory School, which is like the opposite of the last school that we just mentioned. They basically say uh, there are very, there's some very good academics in this school who argue that um, Ronald Reagan deserves the credit for the end of the Cold War, right? Um, it was his policies, um, his economic policies, his sort of um, ramping up of military spending, SDI, et cetera, that forced the Soviets to come to the negotiating table because they couldn't afford to keep up with US military spending. Uh, once again, I don't think that school's correct. I think there are some, there's some merit to some of the things that, that school says, but not entirely correct. Uh, the fourth school of thought, I think, is, this is where I sort of fit in, is that Reagan and Gorbachev worked together uh, to set the foundation for the end of the Cold War. And this narrative gives credit to people like George H.W. Bush, right, uh, who actually oversaw the dissolution of the Soviet Union, um, whereas other schools, you know, George H.W. Bush is seemingly not important at all. Uh, either Reagan was successful in doing it or Gorbachev had set things in motion to such an extent that it doesn't really matter what uh, the Bush administration did from 1989 to 1992. 
All right, so let's go ahead and jump into it. Um, I want to give you just a little bit of backstory. We don't have to get time to go into all the different wrinkles, right? All the different pieces of foreign policy where conservatives were upset with Reagan. Um, but here are just a couple of examples uh, to sort of give you a sense that it wasn't just Cold War uh, issues that they were upset about. They were upset about the sale of advanced airborne warning systems and control systems to Saudi Arabia, okay? Uh, argument was that this undermined Israel's security. Uh, Terry Dolan specifically wrote uh, Reagan at great, uh, wrote in the press at great lengths about how this was undermining Israel. Reagan actually had a showdown with the Israeli prime minister where he basically said that the president gets to make foreign policy for the United States, not foreign uh, leaders, right? Uh, could just imagine, right, a Democrat saying that today, right, they'd be torn apart, right, by the Israel lobby, uh, condemned, right, for being anti-Israel. Um, Reagan was attacked. Uh, on, those, on those sort of merits by people like Irving Kristol, uh, Norm Podhertz, and others. Taiwan, Reagan accepted China's nine-point plan for Taiwan, which including reduced weapon sales from the U.S. Once again, very much upsetting American conservatives who were dedicated to uh, maintaining Taiwan's independence and security. Um, conservatives were also very, very hostile to Reagan because of what they perceived as his lack of public response uh, to basically the crackdown in Poland in 1981. Uh, we now know that there's a new book that just came out uh, that shows that he actually, the CIA was engaged in a lot of covert operations in Poland and helped Solidarity to a large extent. But conservatives at the time didn't know that, right? And so people like Norman Potteritz and others were very, very, um, they, were, they voiced their concerns and their frustrations with Reagan for not doing more um, in media. Conservatives also, in 1981, 1982, really wanted a much more aggressive foreign policy towards the Soviets, including an embargo on technology and grain shipments to the country. Um, they had sort of, uh, Reagan had sort of mocked Jimmy Carter for his uh, embargo of grain to the Soviet Union, but when he got into power, he was torn about whether he had sort of American business interests versus sort of uh, humanitarian concerns when it came to the Soviets. And oftentimes, Reagan fell on the side of American industry and not on the side, at least initially, uh, of, um, of what they might call the sort of moral aspects. And I'll show you a cartoon here in a little bit where conservatives mock him using, uh, using cartoons. So this all prompted Norman Potteritz in 1982 to write an extended column. It's very long. It's a great source. It's like, I don't know, seven or eight pages. It's called The Neoconservative Anguish Over Reagan's Foreign Policy. And in this, he systematically dismantles the idea that Ronald Reagan had had any achievements in the foreign policy arena in his first two years in office. Potters complains that Reagan had been almost completely focused on the economy, which Reagan himself would acknowledge that he had been largely focused on the economy, after all, uh, you know, thinking about, if you will, like the successes of the tax cuts and whatnot. Um, but Potters insisted that the Reagan administration had not outlined a clear vision for how they wanted to wage the Cold War. The result, according to Potters, was a vacuum into which have come pouring all the old ideas and policy against which Ronald Reagan himself has stood so many years. Potters continues, um, specifically talking about the Soviet Union, to say that Reagan had actually even followed a strategy of helping the Soviet Union stabilize its empire rather than a strategy aimed at encouraging the breakup of that empire from within. His criticism was so piercing that Reagan actually picked up the telephone and called him. And they had an extended conversation, and Potteritz details this in his memoirs, where, where Reagan basically was like, they went through it, right? And Reagan talked to him about his strategy. And Potteritz was like, no, that still call, sounds like detente to me. And Reagan tried to convince him again. And Potteritz was like, okay, Mr. President, all right, thank, all right, thank you for the phone call, right? And in his memoirs, he says, it was detente. Right? Like, he was following a detente, maybe a better form of a detente than Jimmy Carter had followed, but to Potteritz, it was still some measure of detente with the Soviet Union. Probably the most piercing, one of the most piercing uh, sort of critiques of Reagan, though, came shortly after that in July of 1982 when Conservative Digest published an entire issue, an entire issue dedicated to whether or not Ronald Reagan had deserted conservatives. Uh, where's the best of me, right? A play on sort of the where's the rest of me from bedtime from Bonzo, I believe, um, where Reagan's sort of fading out, right? He starts in very pure, clear colors, principled, and then seemingly fades out. 
Has Reagan deserted the conservatives was the sort of title of Conservative Digest. Now, conservative, you could say Conservative Digest is a publication put together by the New Right. The New Right throughout the 1980s is going to be extraordinarily critical of Reagan because he's not going to do much on school prayer. He's not going to do much on abortion. He's going to appoint pro-life judges, but he's not going to use his political capital on social issues. Um, that's a choice that the administration made. They're going to focus on foreign policy and economic policy. So social conservatives throughout the administration throughout the eight years, are always mad. So the new right is always the most vocal critic. So you might just say it's just them. But no. Uh, Vigory, who, um, Richard Vigory, who's the publisher, um, reached out to conservatives from all over the spectrum. Okay, So we have conservatives from every, every sort of walk within the conservative movement, neoconservatives, traditional conservatives, libertarians, um, and, of course, new right critics uh, in this um, source. And I, I still don't own this. I'm still looking, right? So if anybody ever finds this on eBay or something, let me know. I'll pay you like a finder's fee, right, uh, to purchase it and send it to me. Uh, I really want this. I found it in the archives and, you know, what can you do? Um, so what did they say? What are some examples of what they had to say in this 1982 uh, critique? Well, Daniel, Daniel, General Daniel Graham, the chairman of the Coalition for Peace Through Strength, asserted that, quote, there is very little difference between Reagan's, Carter, Reagan's policy and Carter's policy. This is in regards to foreign policy. Uh, Joseph Churba, former analysis of Reagan's armed control and disarmament agency, lamented, we have no strategy for the Soviet threat. Albion Knight, uh, I love this quote, I'm not disappointed, I'm disgusted. And he gave Reagan a 2 out of 10 on foreign policy. Medj Dechter, who I believe is still at Heritage, although she may be emeritus, um, said that Reagan was pursuing the same old policy of detente. She concluded that if Reagan were not in office now, he'd be leaving the opposition. He'd be leaving the opposition to these policies. They also had in the issue right cartoons, like the one over here on the right, of Reagan talking with Brezhnev. Brezhnev Reagan's basically scolding Brezhnev. It's very poor resolution. I apologize. I didn't realize when I took the photograph in the archives that this would become a, like a, I would try to use it on a slide. Uh, but um, he's basically criticizing Brezhnev. If you look really close, he's like, Bre he finally is like, well, what did you want to talk about, right? And Brezhnev's like, I'd like to purchase some, some grain. And Reagan's like, how much? Right? Like, so it's like this idea that Reagan is all talk and no actual substance when it comes to policy. That when push comes to shove, he's going to um, basically fall on the side of promoting American economic growth uh, and rehabilitation, right? Rather than, and recovery, rather than uh, sort of the moral high ground, if you will, which would be maybe taking a tougher stance with the Soviets on technology and grain. So I hope at this point, you're a little surprised that conservatives were actually frustrated with Reagan on sort of the way he was handling the Cold War. Now, that Conservative Digest issue also had major criticisms of Reagan for increasing taxes in 1982, major criticisms for not getting a balanced budget amendment through Congress, and of course, massive criticisms on the social front for not doing more uh, for school prayer and also uh, on the abortion issue. So that volume literally, like if you just wanted to take the whole book, right, and you're like, the argument distilled into one source, right? This source has it all. Um, but let's get back on, on sort of track here. So the Reagan paradox. Ronald Reagan, when I teach Ronald Reagan to my students, um, a lot of times I try to get across the idea that Ronald Reagan was both an adamant anti-communist, which everybody knew at the time. Everyone at the time knew that Ronald Reagan was an anti-communist, from his time in Hollywood, dealing with, uh, with communists in Hollywood, uh, to his reading of Whitaker Chambers, uh, witness, right, to being a spokesman of General Electric, Reagan was an adamant anti-communist. He probably had the best anti-communist credentials in the country, which is, makes it even uh, sort of more astounding at the criticisms that are going to come later on in this lecture. But the thing that people didn't actually know about Reagan, but they should have, because he said it over and over again throughout the 1970s and 1980s, was that Ronald Reagan was a nuclear abolitionist. He believed in the eradication of nuclear weapons. He thought they were dangerous. He didn't think civilization should, that any civilization should have these. And he would love to see the day uh, when they were completely eradicated. The problem is, is that Reagan's anti-communist rhetoric was heard. And Reagan's nuclear abolitionist rhetoric often was mentioned and then disappeared. Conservatives would whisper about it behind the scenes, like, did you, did you hear what he said? that, right? He doesn't really mean that. 
Uh, so there's this sort of paradox. And no one's going to actually remember or sort of give Reagan a whole lot of credit for the nuclear abolitionist, uh, the nuclear abolitionist part of his sort of thought. Reagan, for the first two years, as I've already shown you, really is focused on the economy. He's focused on economic recovery. Um, that's his primary concern. Um, there are some foreign policy initiatives. But in 1983 is the year that Reagan really becomes more assertive. And it's the year that conservatives really, really praise Reagan for what he's doing. Um, I got a couple examples up here, right? Uh, the announcement of the Strategic Defense Initiative, SDI, in 1983, obviously pre pleases conservatives. Reagan, though, saw SDI not as a sort of um, activist measure against the Soviet Union, but a defensive measure. That if we had SDI technology, if we had a missile shield, right, where we could shoot down potentially incoming Soviet missiles, it would make nuclear weapons irrelevant, that we wouldn't need to have nuclear weapons. So SDI, from Reagan's view, was actually part of his strategy, right, to get to a world where we wouldn't have to have uh, nuclear weapons. Um, the Soviet Union didn't see it that way. Uh, the Soviet Union was convinced that Reagan wanted to launch a pre preemptive strike on the Soviet Union, that he was willing to do that. Um, the KGB uh, put into place Operation Ryan early on in the 1980s, right after Reagan comes into office, which is basically, if you hear anything about this, right, be looking, because we think it's a possibility. Matter of fact, we think it's a likelihood that this president is not like Richard Nixon, who would go out and say terrible things about communists and then would work with them, right, the sort of founder of detente, right, with Kissinger. They say he's not like that. He actually means the crazy stuff that he says. And so the Soviets are extraordinarily afraid, right, that SDI is just part of Reagan's ploy to make it to where the United States could launch a preemptive strike on the Soviet Union. So it's an extraordinarily destabilizing policy, at least from the Soviets' point of view, and in terms of Cold War and sort of superpower relations. Reagan also decides to go ahead and keep a promise that he made, which was to deploy Pershing miss missiles uh, to Western Europe uh, in response to the Soviets having SS-20s uh, posted in Eastern Europe. Okay? Uh, this is something that Carter had agreed to. Reagan came into office and said, I will do the same thing. Uh, this ultimately, in 1983, leads to negotiations breaking down in Geneva over uh, nuclear arms. Okay? Uh, the, the Soviets walk away from the table, Reagan and Secretary Schultz say they'll be back, but nonetheless, right, they walked away. Uh, Reagan also escalates his rhetoric, um, of course, right, the evil empire speech given um, at the 41st Annual Convention of the National Association of Evangelicals, uh, where Reagan really paints the Cold War in the starkest of terms, the starkest of ideological terms, a battle between good and evil, and implores uh, social conservatives to not sit on the fence and to not embrace the nuclear freeze movement uh, but rather to write, uh, basically recognize that this is a conflict between two uh, fundamentally different societies, one espousing sort of Western liberal values and the other uh, who, of course, oversaw the gulag. All of this contributes to 1983 being the year of fear, the year of fear. To the Soviets, as I've already said, SDI represents a break. It represents a real danger. The threat of mutually assured destruction, MAD, right, which had kept the world from potentially using nuclear weapons, is now threatened by the idea that the United States might be able to uh, get this technology, which would allow a pre uh, preemptive strike. Also, flight KAL-007 um, shot down from the United States to Korea. It's a Korean airliner. Uh, 269 passengers die, including 63 Americans. It's shot down by the Soviets. It's strayed into Soviet airspace. The Soviets monitored it for two hours and then shot it down. 269 people are killed. And I think what troubled Reagan the most was the fact that they'd had two hours to contact the Americans, and the Americans were never contacted. Americans learn about it. He learns about it the next day. And then the third thing that happens in 1983 is that the United States and its NATO allies conduct military um, exercises known as Abled Archer, Able Archer um, which simulated the use of nuclear weapons um, and tested sort of processes. The Soviets pick up on Able Archer when it happens. The KGB, right, we had a double agent in Britain, London at the time, Oleg, and I forget his last name, pick, they pick up 
on Operation Ryan, they know, or excuse me, on uh, Able Archer. They know what's happening, but it looks really real. It looks damn real. And it was actually designed to have the, the Helmut Kohl, Margaret Thatcher, Ronald Reagan all involved in the sort of war games. That was finally called up because they're like, well, maybe the Soviets might interpret that badly. Yeah, they, they would have. They would have freaked out more so than they already did. Um, if you read his book, Oleg's book, the KGB, he talks about how the Soviets were on like code red. Like they were at that level. They believed this was it. We came very close. They were, they were ready to intercept. Um, ultimately, it passes without anything major happening. But all these things lead to an escalation in tensions in the Cold War uh, between the two superpowers. And why I'm telling you about all these things, because I know it sounds really like, like, man, the historian, he really got going, and now he's like really deep into like the 80s. But I'm telling you all these things because all these things contributed to how Ronald Reagan is going to change his policy in 1984. He's going to shift. He's going to realize this. And one of the things that conservatives take away from Reagan when they say that Ronald Reagan had these conservative principles and he always stuck to them, he never flinched, is they rob him of what is probably his greatest strength, his ability to evolve, his ability to take in new data, to process it, and then to address the world as it is, not as he would have it be. That's an ability that Lincoln demonstrated during the Civil War as well. I think it's called statesmanship. Um, another thing that was tremendously, um, tremendously affected Reagan, I almost used the word impact, and that would have been a tragedy. Uh, but it's another thing that really affected Reagan negatively, or, or maybe positively, is that he watched ABC's The Day After. Um, I don't want to pick on people, but did you by any chance watch The Day After when it came out? Yeah, okay. Uh, sorry, I didn't get myself in trouble, right? Uh, but, you know, this was, this was a big thing. When, when ABC's The Day After came out, uh, Americans, they, they went in front of their TVs, families watched. It was pretty graphic, pretty, uh, pretty intense as well. Well, ABC actually sent President Reagan a copy of the film before it was released so he could watch it um, at Camp David, and he did just that. Um, and film had an effect on Reagan that policy briefings never would, and that's partially because of his background in Hollywood. It's the way he processed information. Um, that's not a knock on President Reagan. That's just the way he processed information. And so after he watched the film, he recorded in his diary that it had left him greatly depressed and that he was aware of the need for the world to step back from the nuclear precipice. He also, shortly after this, uh, finally asked to be brief about the, <laughs> the nation's nuclear war plan. He had kind of avoided a full, full, detailed, down briefing. Uh, when he gets it, um, he defines it as the most sobering experience. And in his memoirs, called, it said, in several ways, the sequence of events described in the briefings paralleled what was shown right in the ABC movie. And so the KAL crash, right? where the Soviets didn't reach out to the United States, made Reagan think. He asked Secretary Schultz, he asked others, he was like, why didn't they talk to us? What if this was something bigger? What if it wasn't just 269 people, just, right? What if it wasn't just almost 300 lives that were lost? What if it was a nuclear issue? It was a nuclear issue. What could happen? What's going on with the lack of communication between our countries, that they can't pick up the phone or they can't go back channel and get in touch with us within two hours? Likewise, news comes from Britain News comes from London. They send across Oleg's report, right? They send it across the Atlantic to, uh, to the White House, and Reagan gets to read about how the, how the KGB interpreted Abel Archer. And he's like, they couldn't possibly actually think that we would pre preemptively strike them, could they? We're a civilized nation. There's no way we would ever do that. They can't believe that, but they did. And Reagan started to get a sense of the effect that language and words had upon the Soviets and the KGB the effect that his, you know, his sort of, the things that he said could potentially have upon civilization, uh, the existence of civilization. And so the day after Abel Archer ended, Reagan makes his first public appeal for the total elimination of nuclear armaments. He says, quote, I believe there can be only one policy for preserving our precious civilization in this modern age. A nuclear war must, uh, a nuclear war can never be won and must never be fought. I know I speak for people everywhere when I say our dream is to see the day when nuclear weapons will be banished from the face of the earth. And then in January, he sits down with uh, Secretary of State Schultz, right, and they draft uh, a new sort of foreign policy. Now, Reagan had said some of these things 
at times in campaign stops, in speeches, other things like that. But in January of 1984, they really start to solidify it into a policy. Um, and they decide to shift their public tone. And every once in a while, Reagan will <laughs> deviate from this, right? If you're thinking about Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall, right? Every once in a while, Reagan will deviate from this, and he'll be praised by conservatives when he does. Um, but for the most part, their goal after January of 1984 is to establish better working relationships with the Soviets, marked by better cooperation and understanding. And I think it's really important to note that this shift in the Reagan administration took place a full 15 months before Secretary Gorbachev right, comes into power. Reagan um, is ready to begin really working with the Soviets on arms reductions. As he would say, right? I was ready. They just kept dying on me. Andropov will die in early, I believe, in early 1984. And, uh, you know, uh, Chernenko will die uh, very quickly after taking office as well. And then we will eventually, 15 months later, right, get um, uh, a little bit later, get Gorbachev. I don't have a whole lot of time to go into these things. I'm going to assume you guys know a little bit about the Geneva Summit and the Reykjavik Summit. Uh, but... Um, Reagan and Gorbachev, sort of at the request of Thatcher, Thatcher actually reaches out to Reagan and says, um, this is someone we can work with. This is a new type of Soviet leader. Gorbachev was the only leader of the Soviet Union born after the October Revolution. He represented a new generation. And he does bring new ideas, um, in some ways similar to what Andropov had wanted to do when he took office, um, but was unable to do because of his age and some other constraints. Gorbachev faces dire a dire, dire situation within the Soviet Union. Alcoholism is rampant. Um, the financially, uh, there are major problems from the war in Afghanistan. They're overextended. Uh, domestically, there are, you know, they need more consumer goods. It's always a problem. And the only way to sort of achieve these things is to try and ratchet down, right, ratchet down the Cold War uh, conflict. And so Gorbachev is pushed to negotiate with Reagan, um, in a sense, because he's got some domestic, real serious domestic concerns. Um, and he's promising reforms. And if he's going to achieve reforms, he's going to have to have a cooling of tensions uh, with the United States. So, uh, and so Gorbachev and Reagan decide to meet. They first meet at Geneva, uh, November 19th and 20th, 1985. Um, Reagan at Geneva talks about how he'd like to see a future where there are no nuclear weapons. Uh, Gorbachev sort of, OK, that's nice. Um, that's really idealistic. Um, but they're actually like, they get along really well. They're pushed, they're shuffled into a separate room, as you see here, right? This photograph is probably staged. But nonetheless, they're, you know, they're set down. They have what is described by both of them to be a very frank but a very uh, positive conversation in terms of building trust between one another. Trust between one another. And a belief that they could potentially work together. They start to build this relationship. Reagan always said that the reason why they had nuclear weapons was because they didn't trust one another. That was the major reason. If we could only establish the trust, then maybe we could address the arms issues after that. So the Geneva summit breaks up without there being like a whole lot done concretely, but they agree to meet again at Reykjavik. And conservatives are losing their minds after Geneva. They're extremely concerned because this doesn't look good. The president was just reelected, right, in 1984. And they had hoped that 1984, a Reagan without the obligation of having to go back before the voters, would mean a stronger Reagan, a more uh, aggressive and assertive Reagan, not a Reagan willing to sort of sit down with the Soviets and potentially give away SDI in negotiations, which is their great fear. They're not sure what's going on with Reagan. Why is he negotiating with the man who's the head of the evil empire? This obviously doesn't speak for everyone within the conservative movement, but there were some, many, who had concerns, including Jack Kemp, Richard Biggery, Howard Phillips, and others. They are so concerned that they sit down with President Reagan before the Reykjavik summit. And they're like, listen, you're not going to give away SDI, are you? And Reagan, Reagan says, well, no, I'm not going to compromise away. I'm not going to give away S SDI. I'm gonna, I, I might offer it to the Soviets as well, which Reagan will continually do. He'll tell Gorbachev, like, you're concerned about SDI. You don't need to be concerned about SDI. I'll give you the technology for SDI, right? We can share the technology because Reagan's goal is not to be a, to launch a preemptive strike. It's to ultimately get rid of uh, the weapons altogether. Um, but Reagan starts that meeting with conservatives by basically telling them that Gorbachev is indeed a different type of Soviet leader, to which some conservatives in the room laugh. 
sort of an indignant sort of response to, to Reagan believing that he truly was different, right, than others. When Reagan goes to Reykjavik, October 11th, 12th, 1996, right, um, he famously walks away from the table. Um, they had Gorbachev and Reagan almost came, they, they came very, very close to making a comprehensive uh, deal on intermediate ballistic missiles. They almost uh, did it, but at the end of the day, uh, Gorbachev once again uh, put out there that Reagan would have to uh, keep SDI in the laboratory for 10 years. That would be the condition for the agreement, that SDI, he promised that SDI uh, be confined to the laboratory uh, for 10 years. Which honestly wasn't that bad of a request. Uh, most people in the Pentagon would have told you if you'd asked them that it probably was going to be 10 years before SDI was going to be ready to be out of the laboratory anyways. But Reagan, uh, who is really the one, maybe not the only, but one of the predominant believer in SDI, says no. There will be no condition like that. And he walks away from the table. He's in, he's, he's, he can look at his face. He's extremely pissed at Gorbachev that he threw this condition on him right at the end of the conference. And so conservatives celebrate. <laughs> They're like, yes, no deal was done, right? We, we, we preserved SDI. Uh, the evil empire is still the evil empire. Um, but negotiations continue, right, behind the scenes. Their teams continue to negotiate. And what that ultimately comes to, the sort of fulfillment of this, the, the talks that have taken place at Geneva and at Reykjavik, is ultimately, of course, the INF Treaty, which is signed at the Washington Summit. And this is where we can get back to some of the nice, juicy quotes uh, from conservatives being outraged at President Reagan. William F. Buckley, um, the editors of National Review, were so upset with the INF Treaty that they wrote an entire, they dedicated an entire issue of National Review and titled it Reagan's Suicide Pact. Reagan's Suicide Pact. It featured um, Jack Kemp, Henry Kissinger, and Richard Nixon, who wrote their first, their first column together since Watergate. They thought this was so important that they should come together and write a criticism of President Reagan uh, for what he was trying to do. Um, their criticisms largely took three forms, and this is going to sound very familiar. The treaty was not verifiable. It left the Soviets with significant advantages in conventional weapons, which it did. And they questioned if the treaty was motivated by domestic political concerns. Does anybody know what domestic political concerns uh, might be at play here? Okay, that's right, Iran-Contra had broken, uh, I think about a year or so before, late 1986, I'm like, this was, I wasn't sure, anyways, around that time, it had broken, Reagan's under pressure, right, we have the, all sorts of investigations into this, Reagan, for the first time in his administration, the public doesn't trust him, the public had always trusted Ronald Reagan. And even if everybody else thought he was wrong, he could poll and he could see, right? Not that he relied on polls, because he didn't. He's not President Clinton. Uh, but he could see, right, like, like the people are with me. The people, they trust me. But for the first time, people started to believe that maybe Ronald Reagan wasn't telling the truth, right? Maybe he had lied to the American people, and that really affected him. So it's possible, conservatives said, right, that maybe Reagan was being influenced by this hit from a wrong contra. Let's look at what Nixon and Kissinger had to say. They insisted, quote, that any Western leader who indulges the Soviets' disingenuous fantasies of a nuclear-free world count, courts unimaginable perils. And they said, listen, it's natural for every president to want to leave behind this legacy as a peacemaker. But Reagan needed to remember that however he may be held in today's headlines, the judgment of history would severely condemn a false peace. And so the criticisms of Reagan and National Review are quite, they're quite strong. Um, and it's really magnified by the fact that Buckley and him had been so close for so long. Like Buckley literally picks up the phone and calls him and says, hey, right, I'm sending you over an advanced copy of National Review's the, uh, of, this, of this magazine, right? Read it and then be in touch with me. Like, I'm sorry, but like, we're printing this. Uh, and they have a phone conversation about it where they basically just fundamentally disagree about whether or not the Soviets will actually right, uh, adhere to the agreement. My favorite source, my absolute favorite source uh, in the entire book is this one right here. Um, the New Right, 
uh, led in this instance by Howard Phillips, took out a full page ad in many, many, I don't know the exact number, but I think it's in the hundreds of conservative papers across the country. And it said this, appeasement is as unwise in 1988 as it was in 1938. And they put a picture of Neville Chamberlain, right, up there on the left, and right underneath him a picture of Ronald Reagan. And on the right, they have a picture of Adolf Hitler and a picture of Mikhail Gorbachev, right? Help us defeat the Reagan Gorbachev INF Treaty. I don't know how much you all hang out with conservatives, but if you get compared to Neville Chamberlain, that is as bad as it gets, okay? It doesn't get any worse than that. Being called Chamberlain, being accused, as Jack Kemp will accuse Ronald Reagan on the next slide, of basically indulging or creating a nuclear Munich with the INF Treaty. Um, so Howard Phillips prints this, right? Uh, it goes out in, uh, in, in about 100 or so papers. So... What happened with the INF Treaty? Like, if you know your history, you know the INF Treaty passed. It passed overwhelmingly. Most conservatives in, in the Senate supported it. But Senate conservatives did try, uh, they did propose holdback amendments and modifications in an attempt to torpedo the treaty. Um, and with the exception of Vice President Bush, who was loyal, every GOP uh, presidential hopeful opposed the INF Treaty. Jack Kemp, right, in a speech at the Heritage Foundation, labeled it a nuclear Munich and insisted that his Senate colleagues vote against it. Now, I do think that to a certain extent, there's some strategy going on here by, Senate, the, by the Senate conservatives. They ultimately just, this is probably already going to happen, but they really want to make Reagan aware that future deals will face criticism. And so he's already given away what amounts to 5% of our nuclear weapons, right? We need to like really hit him as hard as we can so that he recognizes there will be pushback if he wants future deals. So there's some strategery, right, if you will, uh, going on here. All right, uh, so how did the new right respond to the INF Treaty? Well, I've already given you, right, Howard Phillips's full page ad uh, in, the, uh, in the Washington Times. How much worse could it get? Well, Howard Phillips, once again, exclaimed that Ronald Reagan is a very weak man with a strong wife and a strong staff, and added that Reagan was a useful idiot for Soviet propaganda. He even then went on NPR and repeated it, right? When he was pressed, he's like, no, that's exactly what I meant. He's a useful idiot for Soviet propaganda. Richard Vigory, another new right activist, asserted that Reagan is, quote, now aligned with his former adversaries, the liberals, the Democrats, the Soviets. We feel alienated, abandoned, and rejected by the president. Vigory called Reagan an apologist for Mikhail Gorbachev and exclaimed that the INF treaty represented a splitting of the blanket. Conservatives will file for divorce and never reconcile again. Paul Weirich, another new right a uh, member of the New Right, labeled Reagan as a weakened president, weakened in spirit as well as clout, and not in a position to make judgments about Gorbachev. So what actually happened? Well, Reagan and Gorbachev do ultimately right, uh, sign the INF Treaty at the Washington Summit. Um, it's actually probably the, it's the biggest achievement of Ronald Reagan's foreign policy uh, career, I would say. It's the, it's the, some, the monumental achievement the destruction of 2,692 uh, 2, weapons, 846 American, uh, some 1,846 Soviet weapons. About 5% uh, of their overall arsenals are destroyed. Um, it's his principal foreign policy achievement. He had others. I'm not saying he didn't have other foreign policy achievements, uh, but when you teach this to a survey class, you're hitting this, all right? This is something you're, set, you're talking about. Uh, to get this agreement, though, Reagan had to actually ignore conservatives. And not just, you know, the far right folks. No, he had to ignore large swaths of the conservative movement in order to uh, get this agreement. Gorbachev, Schultz, Reagan, all in their memoirs said that the INF Treaty and the relationship that Reagan established with Gorbachev set the foundations for a peaceful end to the Cold War. That this is what set the foundation that President Bush would build off of and that Gorbachev uh, would give Gorbachev sort of the wiggle room back home to make modifications to the Soviet system so that things could ultimately change. This presentation wouldn't be complete without a disastrously wrong quote from George Will, so we have to include it. Um, writing in Newsweek near the end of Reagan's second term, Will lamented how wildly wrong 
Reagan was about what was happening in Moscow. Reagan has accelerated the moral disarmament of the West, Will said. Actual disarmament will follow by, by elevating wishful thinking to the status of political philosophy. Will, sort of the money quote, though, is this. He exclaimed that December 8th, the day that the INF Treaty was signed, will be remembered as the day that the Cold War was lost. So thank you for that, George Will. Um, beautiful source, if you're me, right? Like, it's, oh my goodness, uh, the day that the Cold War was lost. And so when the 1988 election comes up, conservatives are actually, when Reagan's term is sort of ending, conservatives are actually quite reflective about what was accomplished. And when they look back, you know, they got taxes, tax cuts in 1981, they got tax reform in 1986. Um, there were other achievements along the way, but in terms of like fundamentally changing the nation in the same way that FDR changed the nation, which was the goal of the conservative movement, many of them actually feel that they failed, which I sort of led with at the beginning of the talk. So now the question that I have for you guys is, how did we go from what I've shown you, and there are lots more great examples in the book, which is available for pre-order on Amazon, uh, but how did we go right from the, um, from the stuff that I've shown you, the comments that I've showed you from major conservative leaders who represented, by the way, all of the grassroots organizations, you know, how did we go from that to what we have today? How did that process happen? Well, I don't know if I have time to explain that entire process. Once again, you, you're going to have to read the book uh, to, to sort of like find out how did conservatives recreate uh, sort of the Reagan re legacy? How did they reimagine Reagan or, re or resurrect Reagan, right, to be something different than what he actually was? But what I want to talk to you about now is how Reagan envisioned his own foreign policy legacy. What did he think his own legacy was in regards to the Cold War? Ronald Reagan never claimed to have won the Cold War. Never claimed to have won it. Now, maybe he was just being humble. Okay? Maybe he was just being humble. That's possible. When he did discuss the fall of the Berlin Wall, which happened, of course, a year or so after he, was, he left office. It happened after he left office. Reagan didn't say, well, it was my policies. I spent the Soviets into bankruptcy, and that's what caused the end of the Cold War and the fall of the Berlin Wall. No, Reagan said... It was the brave men and women on both sides of the Iron Curtain who devoted their lives and sometimes sacrificed them so that we might inhabit a world without barriers. It's also a wonderful, wonderful speech, the Brotherhood of Man speech, if you want to like, uh, talk about sort of Reagan's view on walls uh, and sort of free movements of peoples, just throwing that out there. Reagan also in this speech gave credit to Margaret Thatcher, right, Helma Cole, and Mikhail Gorbachev for their roles in ending the Cold War. While Reagan was not sure if Gorbachev had listened to him when he had called for the Berlin Wall to be torn down, neither he nor the rulers of Eastern Europe could ignore the much louder chants of demonstrators in the streets of Leipzig and Dresden, in the churches and schools, in the factories, on the farms. A once silenced people found their voice and with it a battering ram to knock down walls, real and imagined. Reagan concluded it was because of these people, it was because of them, that the political map of Europe has been rewritten. It was because of people longing for individual liberty, longing for political freedom, longing for individual rights, who came up, who, who, and it's also because of the Soviets miscommunicated, the East German police miscommunicated about whether or not they were going to shoot people when they approached the wall, and they decided not to. If they had shot folks, maybe the wall wouldn't have come down. But another matter. Uh, Reagan says, no, it was the people of Eastern Europe, right, who ultimately broke down these barriers and led to a collapse of uh, the Iron Curtain. So how does the Reagan, well, another thing that I do in the book is I look at the Reagan, muse, uh, the Reagan Library and Museum, okay, and I, use, I look at the museum exhibits, uh, and I, th I think about how Reagan wanted to remember himself through the exhibits. We know that Reagan actually sat down with the curators and created the text himself. Uh, a lot of that text comes from his own writings. Um, now, it's evolved and changed a little bit since Reagan uh, passed away, or since Reagan left the political scene in 1994, uh, the diagnosis of Alzheimer's. But uh, nonetheless, right, I use the museum as a means by which to sort of um, think about how Reagan wanted to remember himself. And the foundation supposedly tries to carry on that, that sort of, um, you know, that, uh, that mission today, to, to sort of, you know, push how Reagan wanted to remember, right, his own, uh, his own uh, foreign policy legacy and his legacy 
uh, writ large. And at the center, you can, we, as you walk through the, the sort of the foreign policy exhibit, you have a, a room with all these different things that happen in the world. And then there's a doorway. And as you walk through the doorway, this is what you see. And I didn't, unfortunately, there's a guy in the way. But this is what you see. You see a statue of Gorbachev and Reagan sitting there talking with one another. And all around the room are the summits. And the language on those things, the summits basically says it was this relationship, right, that they built that enabled the foundation for the, this, the sort of, uh, the, set the foundation for the end of the Cold War. That it was through negotiation, engaging your enemies, the people you disagreed with, right, and trust, trusting but verifying, right, the famous trust but verify uh, line that ultimately led uh, to an end to the Cold War. Interestingly, the Iran-Contra exhibit is right here as you're going through this door. So, like, I'm not saying it was purposely placed there, but, like, it's placed in such a location that you might just catch, your eye just might catch the screen and the statue instead of looking over here uh, at the Iran-Contra uh, exhibit. Although the exhibit does acknowledge what happened and I think is quite well done. So what, how did Reagan want to remember his role in the Cold War? Well, he never claimed to have won the Cold War. Indeed, he consistently gave credit to others, especially the people of Eastern Europe and the people in the Soviet Union who demanded that the Cold War status quo had to come to an end and to ultimately rejected communism. Reagan does deserve, and I think this doesn't get mentioned enough by non-conservative scholars, Reagan does deserve a ton of credit for believing and acknowledging the bankruptcy of, the communist, as, of communism as a system and for inspiring nationalist movements such as Solidarity in Poland, and now we know supporting them with CIA uh, covert uh, assistance, and for his willingness to go against conservatives, against those in his own party, and to negotiate, to sit down and engage with his enemies. Over the course of the 1990s, however, many conservatives began to claim, and this really happens after Dole's dismal defeat in 1996, there is a reimagining that happens where conservatives begin to claim that Ronald Reagan won the Cold War single-handedly by confronting the evil empire, by sticking to his principles and demanding right that the wall be torn down, and that that's what ultimately led uh, to the, the end of the Cold War. Our most massive of thanks to Professor Witcher for visiting IHS and sharing his work with us. He'll join us again here on the show soon enough, and we'll pick up the story right where he left off. Till then, be sure to subscribe to the show, drop us a rating and review, and I cannot stress enough how helpful those are, and keep the progress coming.